morning in the announcements, uh, Christopher Wilcut is going to be bringing the lesson tonight. Christopher is the son of Melissa and Sam Wilcut, who most of you know. So that makes him my grandson and Linda's grandson. And we are so proud of him that uh, we're so glad that he's able to come and preach the sermon tonight. Christopher is attending the Southwest School of Preaching in Austin, Texas. He's up here for the Christmas break, but um, he is attending the uh, Southwest School of Preaching, and we're proud of that. We're so glad of that. And uh, I just wanted to say that he's finished his first semester, and he's actually preached twice since he's been out of school. So this is his third time. So be kind. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Christopher. I know you do a great, great job. We're looking forward to it. Proud of you. Well, I want to begin just by saying thank you uh, to the congregation here, to the elders here. Um, I've been going to Highland Heights for well, I've been coming for a, a long time just because with grandma and grandpa here, I mean, every year, I remember this congregation for as long as I can remember. I know many of you for, for most of my life and, and many of you have seen me grow up. And so I just wanna say thank you to the congregation for the support that you give me, to the support that you give my family, to grandma and grandpa, and, uh, and thank you to the elders for, for giving me this opportunity to come here and, and to speak before you. Um, to begin, let, I want you to turn to Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10 is where I'll be taking my lesson from today. And while you're turning there, let me ask you a question. How important is worship to you today? How important is worship to you? God takes our worship very seriously, and he expects us to also take worship seriously as well. In Leviticus chapter 10, and verses 1 through 3, we see an example of two men who don't take their worship very seriously. Here we're going to see in verse 1, we're going to see their actions. In verse 2, we're going to see God's response. Or sorry, yeah, we're going to see God's response in verse 2. And in verse 3, we're going to see the reason God gave for the response. And then we'll look at some application. From the example of Nadab and Abihu here in chapter 10, we learn that God must be regarded as holy and must be glorified when we worship him. So let's look at this, let's look at this passage here, chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense in it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. So in verse 1, we see Nadab and Abihu. And I'd like to give some context to Nadab and Abihu. We see that they were the sons of Aaron there in verse 1. These are the priests, the priests that just got consecrated in chapter 8. As the Israelites were in, were in the wilderness of Sinai, they had just built the temple, or sorry, the tabernacle at the end of Exodus, and in Leviticus here we have the establishment of, of the priesthood. So in chapter 8, Aaron and his sons were just consecrated. Looking at verses 35 and 36 of chapter 8, it says, Therefore you shall stay at the tabernacle, at the door of the tabernacle of meeting day and night for seven days, and keep the charge of the Lord, so that you may not die. For so I have been commanded. So Aaron and his sons did all the things that the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses. So we see here in chapter 8 that Nadab, Abihu, and Aaron had just been in the tabernacle for seven days straight, learning all the things that they should do from God. In chapter 9, we see the establishment of the priesthood. Chapter, chapter 9 um, Verses 22 through 24, I'm going to read this, and then I'll continue into verse 3 again, because this is just one, this is one continuous text right here. So chapter, 20, chapter 9, verses 22 says, Then Aaron lifted his hand toward the people, blessed them, and came down from offering the sin offering, the burnt offering, and peace offerings. 
And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people, and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer, put fire in it, put incense in it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So we see here at the end of chapter 9, the glory of the Lord had just appeared before the whole congregation. The whole congregation was gathered here before the tabernacle for the establishment of the priesthood, and the glory of the Lord appeared before them. And then immediately we see that Nadab and Abihu, they go and they offer their profane fire. Some, some translations may say strange fire or profane fire, but what is this profane fire? Well, it doesn't, the text doesn't say. So we don't know exactly what happened, but we do know that it was not commanded. Right there at the end of verse 1, they offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So this was something that, that wasn't commanded after they had just learned at the end of chapter 8 everything that they should have done, they did exactly what they were not commanded to do. They did this immediately after the consecration. They did this immediately after uh, seeing the glory of the Lord. The offering of the incense that they did was commanded. Sorry, the offering of incense was commanded, but the way that they did it was not. Uh, God gave specific instructions for that, and they changed it somehow. So being consecrated priests, Nadab and Abihu, they knew what they should have done. Like I said, they had just been, they had just been in the tabernacle for seven days learning what they should do. So they knew what they should have done, and they didn't do it. They failed to do what they needed to do, either through ignorance or uh, deliberate rebellion. But either way, they did not follow the commandments of God. So we see the actions of Nadab and Abihu here in, in verse 1. In verse 2, let's look at the response. Verse 2, So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. So fire, fire went out from the Lord because they had not followed God's instructions, they had sinned. We, see in, we know in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, that sin is lawlessness. They did not follow the commandments of God, therefore they sinned. And because they had sinned, God executed his judgment on them. They died before the Lord because the consequence of their sin was death. This, is not, this was not a cruel punishment. The, the punishment was just. The punishment was right. God's justice is always right. We know this, and we must trust this when God executes his judgment. The, just, the judgment that he gave at that time was, was immediate death. That's not something that we, often, that we often think about today because it doesn't happen today. But it's good to remember that that's what was deserved. That was what was deserved of their, of their sin was death. So we see the actions of Nadab and Abihu, and we see the response of God from verse 2. Now let's take a look at verse 3. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. So in this, in this verse, God gives, God gives Aaron two reasons of why he did uh, what he did, why he killed Nadab and Abihu. And the, t one of the first reason he gives is he must be regarded as holy. He says at the beginning of, of what he says right there, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. God told Aaron that he must be regarded as holy by those who come near to him. And when Nadab and Abihu came near to him, they did not regard him as holy. They had, they had a heart problem. There was there was something in their heart, in their attitude, that they did not regard God as holy when they came. They were the consecrated priests, and yet they still did not regard God as holy. The second thing he tells them is he must be glorified. He says, before all the people, I must be glorified. God told Aaron that he must be glorified before all the people, 
And when Nadab and, uh, when Nadab and Abihu offered profane fire, they did this in front of the whole congregation. Again, at the end of chapter 9, we have the entire congregation of Israel gathered together before the tabernacle, and then immediately Nadab and Abihu offered their profane fire. They did this before the entire congregation. They were the consecrated priests, they were the example to the people, and yet they still did what was wrong in front of everybody, and that has an effect. As priests, they were supposed to be the example of the holy people. They were supposed to be the example of the things that people should do. <clears throat> and by not doing as God commanded, Nadab and Abihu did not glorify God before the people. So they had an inward problem. They did not glorify God as holy. And they had an outward problem. And their outward example was not right before God. So we see the actions of Nadab and Abihu in verse 1. We see the response of God in verse 2. And we see the reasons for God's response in verse 3. So now let's take a little bit of application from this for us today. Turn with me briefly to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. And this is important for us to remember today. 1 Peter 2, verse 9 says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter here is talking to Christians, and he says, he says that you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. This applies to us today. We today... As the church, as Christians, we are a holy nation. We are the royal priesthood. We're part of the, the kingdom that, that Christ established, and we are the priests of today. Not priests in the same sense as, as Leviticus. We're not physical priests, and we don't do the things that the priests in the Old Testament did. We're the spiritual priests. But it's something that we must consider when we go out into the world when we, and when we do the things that we do, we are the holy priesthood of God's kingdom. So one application that we can, that we can, uh, that we can get from this is we must be sure to worship God exactly as he commanded. I think many of us understand that. Um, and it's easy to see from this, from this, uh, from this passage when, when God commands something, we must do it exactly as he commanded. When God commanded Nadab and Abihu to offer the incense, they had to do it exactly as he commanded. When they didn't, they got God's judgment. So we must be sure that we're doing things, we're, doing our, we're worshiping God exactly as he commands. So one example, somewhat of a silly example, but bear with me here. Imagine if instead of the Lord's Supper, Instead of the unleavened bread and the grape juice, we decided to, we decided to get steak and sweet tea, because that tastes better, right? I mean, I, I sure like a good steak and, and, and sweet tea, but that's not, that's not what God commanded, and we know that, and that's, that's understandable. But when, when God commands us to sing, well, what happens when we bring a piano in to keep the tune? God commands us to sing. And so when God commands us to sing, we're not going to do anything else. We're going to sing. When God commands men to lead, the men are going to lead, and we're not going to do anything else. And when God commands us to take the Lord's Supper every week, we're going to take the Lord's Supper every week, and we're not going to do anything else. Because we know that what God commands, that's what we must do. If we do anything else, then we're going to get judgment. So we must be sure to worship God exactly as he commanded. Another application we can get is we must understand that the consequence of sin is death. Uh, we see that from verse 2. Uh, verse 2 of Leviticus 10, fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now again, in this example right here in Leviticus, they died immediately. Um, but the consequence of sin is the same for us today. The consequence of sin was established in the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, God told, God told Adam and Eve 
that when they, if they were to eat of the garden, eat of the tree of knowledge, they would die. God tells us today in Romans chapter 6 verse 23 that the wages of sin is death. The consequence of sin for us today is still death. It's just, it, but it's not an immediate death. I think we understand that. We, we don't have the immediate death today because of God's mercy. God's mercy is what allows us not to incur this immediate judgment that is deserved. Um, God mercy, God's mercy gives us the chance to repent from sin today. We just, but we do not know how much time he has given to us to repent. Again, the consequence of sin from Nadab and Abihu was deserved. God's judgment is right. And so today, the wages of sin is death is deserved. But we have life through God's mercy, through God's grace. We are allowed the chance to repent and to make things right with him that we might have eternal life. So the, those, are the, those are two points of application that we can, we can get from this passage. But I wanna, the main application that I want to bring forward is, is from God's response in verse 3. God says in verse 3 of Leviticus chapter 10, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. And so we can, say, we can take the same application as, as what he told Aaron in Leviticus we must regard God as holy. When we come before God to worship him, we must have the right attitude. Just going through the motions, just coming to worship, just checking the box, that doesn't cut it. We have to have the right attitude about the worship. When we come here today, we must regard God as holy. We, we must want to come here and worship him and regard him as, as holy. So we must have the right, we must have the right heart. We must have the right attitude towards God when we worship him. And second, when we glorify God, or sorry, we must glorify God in front of the world. Before all the people, I must be glorified. As Christians today, as the holy priests of God's kingdom today, we must be an example of proper worship to the world. When people in the world look at us today, and they do, when they look at us today, are they seeing the things that God commanded? Are they seeing, are, we, are they seeing us do the things that God commanded? Are they seeing us do the right worship? Are they seeing us worship God with the right attitude? Are they seeing us worship God the right way, properly, the way he commanded? Or are they seeing us do things that we want to do that God never commanded? We are the example to the world. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. And if we don't do the things that God commands, then we won't be glorifying God in front of the world. We'll be setting a bad example for, for the world. And anybody who looks at us today will either call us hypocrites or will look or will we'll be led astray if we're not doing the things that we need to do. So we must regard God as holy and we must glorify God in front of the people. So in conclusion, looking at the actions of Nadab and Abihu and the response of God and the reason for their punishment, we can learn many lessons about God's expectation for worship that applies to us today. Are we worshiping God exactly as he commanded? Are we displaying genuine worship, or are we examples of vain and hypocritical worshipers of God? Let's never forget the importance, both in our heart and in our conduct, of true and proper worship to God. Now, just as God has specific instructions for worship, God has also specific instructions for salvation. In the same way as worship, if we do not do exactly as he has commanded, our efforts will be worthless and will lead to death. God's instructions for salvation is here. We see that in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Believe, John 3, 16. Repent, Acts 3, 19. Confess, Romans 10, 9. And be baptized, Acts 2, 38. 
And if we don't do those things exactly as he commanded, it'll be worthless. If you have not done these things and you need to become right with God, there's no better time than today. Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, today is the day of salvation. Maybe, maybe you have done those things. Maybe you are part of the holy priesthood and yet you are not glorifying God in front of the people. Maybe you are not counting him as, you are not regarding him as holy today. Maybe you have, maybe you have been saved, but you're not worshiping God exactly as he commands and expects. Whatever the case may be, if you need anything from the church, please come forward today as we stand and as we sing.